You're listening to Market Champions, a podcast on navigating the financial markets. Here's your host, Shravasa Prakash. This episode of Market Champions is brought to you by Simplify ETFs. For more information, visit simplify.us. No simplified funds will be discussed during this podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. I just wanted to remind you to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. Really helps the page grow, really helps the podcast grow. Thank you so much for your support. And now on to the interview. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. Today, I've got a very special guest on. I've got Chris Bloomstrand, who's the CIO of Semper Augustus, which is a value-focused hedge fund based in St. Louis. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I am you know, delighted to have you here, and I think we're going to have an awesome conversation. Well, it's it's great to be with you. I've been following you here for the last year or so and really impressed with what you've done, You know, regardless of being 17 years old. and I got to say, this is the first podcast I've done with a college freshman. So um, you're somewhat ahead of the game, if not materially ahead of the game. It'll be fun to kind of watch the evolution of your school career and your finance and investing career and what you wind up looking like in four years and 10 years and 20 years. But well done so far. So great to be with you. Thank you. Uh we're, we're probably going to get into a little bit about, you know, your, your advice for younger people and, you know, what people, you know, looking to pursue a career in asset management should be doing, you know, uh, later, later in the podcast. But, you know, first I wanted to start off by, you know, could you sort of give uh, the audience, you know, a quick you know, synopsis of your background and you know, how you actually caught into the industry and, you know, your journey on Wall Street? Yeah, a little bit fluky. I was going to be an engineer, and I played football in college and wound up a lot more fascinated with the Wall Street Journal. I actually had a class in high school where you had to track prices, and so you were tracking the Dow. You were tracking the gold price, interest rates, all of that, and I thought that was very interesting. And when I got into engineering and diff EQ, and I wasn't exactly going to class every day, um, I, I did find myself reading the Wall Street Journal, and so the engineering school in Boulder was right next to the business school, and I kind of felt the gravitational attraction from <laughs> the business school and wound up making the switch, which was great. And, you know, at a point, I just got very interested in investing during school, and I was reading everything I could. It wasn't – investing wasn't really taught. You know, there were – in finance, it was a lot of – discounted cash flows, but not in an investment sense, very much in a project-oriented sense, but heavy on things like the efficient market hypothesis, which I hope in earnest they've dismissed, but I I know it's still taught in school, and you're going to get probably at least a dose of it. I even think it's still part of the CFA curriculum, which I did at a point. But, you know, I I was just very interested in, in investing and wound up losing all my money on my first stock pick, which kind of forced me there to decide whether this was for me or whether I needed to figure out what happened. And having not read any financial statements, not knowing at all what I was doing, I circled back after I lost all my money and read the financial statements on the company. It was a very large crude carrier company in 1990, um, kind of a self-liquidating structure, very old assets. They had four VLCCs, but they were old and they were going to self-liquidate at a point. They were highly levered. Um, distribute all the cash flows over a very short period of time. Anyhow, a couple of the ta- a couple of the tankers were in Kuwait when Saddam Hussein's army invaded and commandeered the assets for a period of time. Uh, but th- th- that really wasn't the reason it was going to go out. But I learned at that point, you really actually need to do some fundamental research. I was reading books on candlestick charting and te- technical analysis, and I was doing Bill O'Neill's Can Slim and I had no idea what I was doing. You know, you just, you find a book and you read it and you go, I'll try this. Yeah, this makes sense. So I was tracking all these individual quarterly stock progressions. And at a point I did a thing in the commercial paper world, oddly, and I won't bore you with that story, kind of during the the back half of the last semester of my senior year. And then for about a year out of school, but I was getting into the investing game as well. And I went to work right out of school for a big Midwestern bank trust company. Wound up managing a mutual fund for them, so a lot of high net worth uh, relationships, institutional relationships, a lot of pension funds, 
was working on some of the very big Missouri state pension funds that we had managed. So I cut my teeth in a lot of ways, and I learned a lot about trust, law, and tax, uh, and certainly the investing game, and had an opportunity to hang a shingle in 1998 with my business partner, who uh, Chad and I had gone to Boulder together, actually, and kind of always theorized that we'd launch an investment firm together. He went on and became a public accountant and auditor, but we would touch base on average once every week or two and talk stocks. It was his hobby. It was my profession and had a had a chance to with a very big family in St. Louis, uh, still kind of our anchor client, um, but with a diversified book of business right out of the gate and material enough to where you know, two guys can make a go of it. We were able to launch our firm in late 98, which happened to be, you know, kind of the peaking of the blue chip stocks and you were getting into the tech bubble. So we knew it was really a lousy time in terms of overall market valuations to launch a money management firm. But in retrospect, it couldn't have been a better time. We were able to take the, the anchor family client largely out of their blue chips. We were able to sell a bunch of businesses that were no longer earning their cost of capital. GE was a monster position. I sold half of it. The stock today here, 22 years later, 23 years later, is 75% below where it was when I was selling it, able to pivot into a lot of the small mid caps, which were really cheap when the tech bubble was raging in late 99, early 2000, built a portfolio trading at 15 times where the NASDAQ was trading at over 240 times and the S&P was pushing 40, had a huge relative and even absolute advantage. So it was a great time. Um, you know, we wound up making money during the first big 50% bear market, 2002. We were up a lot in 2001. We wound up being down about as much as the market in 02, but we made 30-ish percent over that three years and the market was down 50. NASDAQ was down 80. And from there, you know, it's been a good run. We've um, put a lot of processes in place that, that make the investment process repeatable. Chad's built a really nice back office. We don't touch a piece of paper. He's got an operation staff that's just terrific. So it's been a fun run. And I wouldn't trade the, 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 you know, what I had done at the outset and the evolution of what's become Semper Augustus for anything. You know, Mr. Buffett talks about tap dancing to work. You know, I've, I've always felt that way. I've never felt like I worked a day in my life and, you know, wind up doing this thing for 80 hours a week, but it's largely reading and, I get to talk to clients every now and then. I spend a lot of time talking to the companies that we own and various management teams and various industries. And that's just a joy. Um, and I've gotten, as you would, 30 years in professionally, I've gotten a lot better at it. It used to take me a week to get ready to talk to a public company. And I didn't want to embarrass myself. And so you'd read K after K after K and Qs and Qs and years worth of the proxy and, you know, try to get familiar with their competitors and I wanted to make sure I was armed with enough en enough good questions and enough questions where I could learn about the business to sit down with management. Now I can spend 30 minutes and look at something and really kind of know, I think, what the two or three big moving parts are and where the silver bullets are and, you know, what kind of information I'd like to extract over a conversation, which is never quarterly earnings. I mean, I'm never interested when I'm talking to management, what's going to happen in the short term. And once they realize that that I've got a much longer term focus and I really am genuinely interested in the fundamentals of the business, then I find management teams a lot more accessible and a lot more willing to talk strategy because you're not dealing with the nuances of what's the number going to be and I'm trying to trade in and out of this thing. I'm trying to build the core positions that I can own for years and years and decades and in some cases forever. And I'll own cyclicals where I buy them and have an intent to sell them. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, a good chunk of the portfolio is there to exist for a long time. And it's, it, it's, it's just a good process and it's been a lot of fun doing it. Yep. Yep. And you know, when you, when you talk about, uh, you know, the, oh, so since you were up uh, during, uh, you know, this, at the start of the dot-com bubble, at the start of the bust of the dot-com bubble, when, you know, markets came down 50% and, you know, your, your fund was up. So, now, over the last 10 years, what we've seen is sort of the complete opposite, where we've seen sort of value strategies start to underperform, you know, what, what is really, you know, growth or momentum, you know, focus strategy. So, number one, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think, you know, we're going to, uh, you know, say over the next decade or so, see a mean reversion back to the odd performance of value? And uh, more importantly, you know, I want to get to, you know, market valuation, but 
you know, I wanted to you know start off by you know just talking about you know, value investing. Uh, does it work? Uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, do you think it's going to still you know, continue working? And you know how how you're thinking through this? Well, I'm not sure value investing per se is broken. Um, right. I think when you compare what's traditionally called value versus growth, and you can pit the various indices against each other, you can pit the Russell value against the growth indices. I think when you're late in a bull market cycle, and this kind of meshes in with your second question to this, you said you wanted to talk about market valuations. When you get market valuations as stretched as they are today, um, you know, we've never seen multiples to sales any higher. Um, and you, so, and some of that is is record or what's now approaching record profit margins. You've got to make that adjustment. But on across most scales, price to earnings, normalized earnings, price to book, price to cash flow, price to sales, low dividend yield. You know, on a dividend yield basis, we're not back to the ninety basis points that we saw in two thousand, but at one point five or six percent, it's yeah. pretty skinny considering that the payout ratio is almost fifty percent. So fundamentally, the market's expensive. And late in these bull cycles, you tend to see growth having outperformed value. That was very much the case in the late 90s. Some great value managers, almost all great value managers, struggled mightily. I mean, you know, we were up 20-something percent in 99. And even with our current clients, which were all new clients to the firm, some had been clients of mine for years from the bank trust company. There was an enormous amount of pressure to own tech. We would not own tech. We named the firm Semper Augustus, uh, reflective of the most valuable of the tulip bulbs in 1637 Holland. We knew it was a bubble. We knew it was a tech bubble. I wrote up Microsoft as part of my January 1, 2000 client letter and suggested that the stock would produce a negative total return for 15 years, that shareholders would lose money for 15 from that point, which they did. And it had nothing to do with Microsoft's two core businesses, the operating system, and the Word, Excel, PowerPoint suite uh, being bad. I mean, there was no chief technology officer that was going to displace use and move to any kind of a shareware. There's no way. They were firmly embedded. Um, but it was a $620 billion market cap on $20 billion in sales. And they were very profitable at the time. It was arguably, without a doubt, I mean, it was the best company in the world. 15 years as a public company. Revenues had compounded in mid 40s. Um, stock price had compounded. They weren't paying a dividend yet. The stock price had compounded in the 60s, and it was trading at 80 plus times seven and a half or so billion dollars in profits. It was very, very far ahead of itself. It was reflective of a lot of big companies in the tech world, and we didn't own those. And so the NASDAQ was up over 80%. It was either 84 or 87%. In 1999, and we're up 20 something, and people are wondering, yeah. well, why in the heck don't you own tech? The, Mr. Buffett, I bought Berkshire for the first time in February 2000 and went to the annual meeting for the first time a couple months later. He was under all kinds of pressure from a handful of the audience questioners as to why he wasn't smart enough to own tech. I mean, these guys were talking about their individual portfolios and how well they'd done, and you know, the the the, the risks were just gargantuan, and so. You know, there are a lot of parallels today with, with that, that, that market we had seen then. And so I, I look at our own returns. Um, you know, we, we get to 08, and we were down half of the market decline. I was down 20-ish. Market was down high 30s. We, I think we're kind of flattish, maybe under a little bit. Well, we actually outperformed in 09. Our stocks were up more than the overall market, which is pretty remarkable given that we were down by half on the decline. Um, I think in, in 2010, we were under by a couple points, but then in 11, we were ahead by four or five percent. And so at the end of 2011, our stocks would have averaged maybe 11%. And, 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 and when I show performance, um, and we put it in our annual letter every year, we run our overall composite and I run an aug augmented, um, supplemental disclosure for just our stock performance. We've got a lot of family clients and individuals and clients that have different allocations than being fully invested. My largest account is a family foundation that gives away 5% a year to charity. I run the whole thing. 
I've kept it 85% invested. So the benefit of doing that over time is <laughs> they've had a higher allocation to stocks, which have outperformed all the asset classes. And they've had a higher allocation to our stocks, which have outperformed the overall stock market since we took over the portfolio or built the portfolio. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's given away 5% a year. So in a 24 month period of time, we're going to give away 5%, 5%, 5%. You're giving away 15%. So I run it at eight, I run it at 15% cash on average over time. I capture that cash in my overall composite. So when you look at my stock only numbers, which would have been 11 at the end of 2011, and I'm ballparking, they're today 12. If you net out the various levels of cash that we've had in the portfolios, that's been about a 1.9 or 190 basis point drag against the gross equity return. And then you back off a point and change for fees. And so, you know, our net composite number winds up being about 3% below. But at the end of 11, because you'd had the 50% bear market in the S&P, market dropped from 1500 down to 780, I think, um, during that 50% decline, Mm -hmm. recovered fully when the Fed got involved in the markets and kept interest rates very low. You had the real estate bubble. You got the S&P back up to about 1548. GDP had grown by 40%, so you were not as fundamentally overvalued in 07 as you were in 2000, but you were very, very expensive. Right. And then you had the 50% bear market. Well, no, you had the 67% bear market that took the S&P down to 666 at its low. And by 11, uh, the S&P from when we started the firm, which was about a year, year and a half prior to the overall stock market peak in March 2000, the S&P had averaged about 1%. And, you know, we had said, when I when I first put together my intrinsic value report back in March 2000, because um, we needed a tool to show why we didn't own tech and that our portfolio was fundamentally overvalued and what our expectations were for the S&P, I had the S&P fairly valued it under 600, needed to fall over 60% to be fairly valued, which people would have thought was insane. Even Chad, my business partner, said, Chris, you know, we already don't own this tech stuff and people are itching it. why we don't own it. And yeah. the NASDAQ was up 80 something percent. Shouldn't we just say the market's really overvalued, not put a specific number? I think it was 580 or 540 on it. And I said, no, I mean, that, you know, we're not trying to be precisely correct. You know, as Mr. Buffett says, better to be roughly right. But you run this thing through the filter of what you think a broadly defined fair value would be. And it was about two thirds below that number. Um, so at, at 11, we looked really good, um, up 11 ish versus up one. And since then, we have done about 12 and change. And so our long term number is right at 12. So we would have done more than 12. Uh, a little bit more than 12, but we've averaged 12. So in, in the last, so really during this last decade, decade and a year, decade and a couple of years, yep. we've done 12. And that's kind of where our process gets to. The S&P would have done 16%. And I'll tell you, and I've told this story on a couple of podcasts, and I, and I think I've written about it. But from that point in 11, you would have looked at our trailing numbers and thought these guys were geniuses, right? We then went into a four-year period where for the first three of those four years, our stocks averaged about 10, which is kind of on par with where our process gets us. Mm -hmm. But during those three years, the S&P did something like 22%. And so at the end of 12, 13, 14, we're fielding questions from even longstanding clients wondering why our relative performance is so poor. And, you know, you explain we can't control stock prices for three years. Well, then we get into the fourth of those four years in a row, 2015, which saw a broad stock market decline during the year. The average stock was down, I don't know, 20% plus. We wound up being down 10% for the year. The S&P was up 1.4. Berkshire Hathaway, our largest holding, was down explicitly 12.5%. And all of a sudden, um, you know, the natives were a little restless, as you can imagine, because now for four years in a row, Semper's an idiot. And our 10% per year for those three years turned into something like seven, because I was down 10. Yeah. And the S&P's return would have been 15, so I had earned half the market return. And so 
you know, I really needed to put some of the flames out. And so in my annual letter, which at that point was very much a private document, there were 20 uh-huh. or 30 friends outside of our clients that got it. Yep. But I, I needed to explain, look, I can't control, control stock prices for four years. You know, yeah, would it yeah. not make more sense to look through the underlying fundamentals of the businesses? Let's look at the progression of revenues. Let's look at the progression of profitability. Look at the progression of how we define intrinsic value and have those numbers grown for the last four years. You make the same case with Berkshire Hathaway. Mr. Buffett can't control the stock price. Mm -hmm. He can control the type of assets that Berkshire owns with an understanding of the profitability. And was Berkshire more valuable at the end of 15 than it was at the beginning of 15, Mm -hmm. despite the stock being down 12 and a half percent? Well, the answer would have been most definitively yes. Yep. Ditto for the four years. So I was going to explain that. And I thought, you know, Berkshire has grown to be such a large holding. And I've I've bought it at upwards of 20%. I've never put more than 20% of Berkshire in a single account. But it's grown in a lot of our accounts. And I can explain the nuance as to why it's bigger than 20. A lot of which has to do with the fact the company doesn't pay a dividend. And I have very certain clients that distribute capital, like the foundation that, that gives 5% a year to charity. But I had owned Berkshire for a long time. And I think I understood some of the nuances of how cash was produced and some of the accounting treatments and some of the tax treatments that were not either not conventionally understood. And I think there were a couple aspects that I'm not sure anybody else had figured out yet. And I'd always wanted to write up Berkshire and how Semper viewed the company and how I'd analyzed it and the four or five different yardsticks and metrics of how, how, how we, we valued the business and how we use those tools to reconcile against each other. And so I spent 50 or 60 pages of my 2015 letter writing up Berkshire. Joe Coster, a great friend of mine in that universe of 20 or 30 guys that would get my letter every year, called me and said, you know, Chris, you've, you guys have never marketed the firm institutionally. I know you're working on your composites. We, we didn't build composites at the outset for a whole host of reasons. I didn't think we'd fit in a style box, and I didn't think the consultants of the world would cotton to what we were doing. So despite being a CFA in 1994, we did not do our old Aimer and now Gibbs composites until later in the game, which wound up taking a bunch of years to put together. But Joe called me and said, this is a really nice write-up on Berkshire. He was flattering and said I'd, he'd never read a better Berkshire analysis. And he said, look, if you're going to really want to grow the firm and grow the firm institutionally with university endowments and various other institutions, family offices, you need to get this Berkshire write-up out and you need to send your client letter out and you need to do it regularly. And we went back and forth and I protested and said, look, I mean, I, the, you know, a bunch of the guys that I admire in this industry, guys like Seth Klarman, Tom Russo, their letters aren't public. And if they ever hit the internet, they get taken down. And Joe laughed and said, I think he called me up. He wouldn't have called me a bad word, but basically said, you're not thinking about this, right? He said, um, Chris, do you manage as much money as Seth Clark? You run in 30 or whatever billion, right? So, well, that's a good point. So he had a great idea. He said, put it on your website, put a, put a tab up for your letter. And he has his value investing world blog, which is an indispensable blog. He's, it's still there. Uh, he's behind a very low cost paywall, but he's got a great aggregation of a lot of what he sees and reads and useful to see that once a night and link to stuff. And it keeps me current on a lot of things that I wouldn't otherwise see. Anyhow, we kind of had a side bet as to how viewed it would wind up being. And I thought, you know, there are 300 people that want to read about the the tax treatment and the accounting treatment inside of Berkshire. And Joe said it would go viral. Well, it, it wound up going viral. And so and from, from that point forward, our letter's been a public document. We put it on the website, we release it shortly after it's written. Um, I've discussed in various detail Berkshire every year, and I've got myriad other themes that I get into. It, it, was, it was a great decision. Joe was right. He was 100% right. That letter needed to get out. But at the same time, the purpose of the letter originally was the Berkshire write-up and the defense of value and the defense of what we were doing. And turns out from the end of 2015, where our portfolio was really, really undervalued, very undervalued. I would say as cheap as it was, oddly, at the market peak in 2000, when we were so cheap, 
fire truck manufacturers and little thrifts trading at single digit multiples, despite again, the NASDAQ trading at 240 times. We were very inexpensive at the end of 15. Berkshire was very undervalued at the end of 15. And since then we've wound up outperforming and I don't know, somewhere I ran this a few days ago. We, our, our, our stocks alone, again, with no cash allocated to them for the various accounts that have cash, we've done over 18 and the S&P's done 16 and change. So we've, you know, come back and we've beat the market again. And so the, the long-term equity return is 12%. And again, it, you lose a couple of points of drag for cash, but value has suffered. But I, I will not apologize for a 12% return since 11 a 12% return from inception where the S and P since inception has done seven and change. The market was that expensive when we launched the firm. So we had a huge advantage and outperforming in those two bull markets is huge. And so folks that want to look at your one year return, which in our case happens to be well ahead, we were up 23% at June and we're probably close to that. Now we were you know, well down a couple of weeks ago and our energy investments have had a big recovery in the last couple of weeks. We're probably close to where we were in June, but the markets have surged. The NASDAQ is now up 18% or something like that for the year, having been negative at the point where we were up over 20 this year. But I, I, I'm not going to apologize for relatively underperforming from 11 when we did what our process kind of lends itself to doing, which is a 12% return on the stocks, gross of fees and kind of gross of the cash that gets assigned to various accounts. I've probably had, we've, we've probably had a better experience than a lot of the value, quote unquote, value investors ha have had in the last handful of years, certainly since the end of 15. I think we do a really nice job trading within the portfolio, trimming things that are expensive, keeping our compounders. We're very heavy in energy today, and I've done that three times in the firm's history. So we'll, we'll own cyclicals even though it's a lot more fashionable today for everybody to want to own compounders and things that are great businesses, you've got to be constructive on kind of the intermediate term and, and you've got to have some catalysts in place when you're going to own cyclicals. That, that's certainly the case today. But, you know, I find our, our returns acceptable, I think kind of in line with where they should be. And I think our clients largely, uh, many of whom have been with us for a lot of years, you know, the 22, 23 year history of the firm. And in some cases, clients that were with me prior to our starting the firm, you know, they kind of know what we expect to earn and how and what we expect to do. And, you know, we don't have any pressure at all. Uh, really, really, the only pressure we had was not owning tech in 99 and four years of, of you know, certainly, certainly relative underperformance. But, you know, even when you had that 10% down year in 15, four years where you've made seven. But again, the gun was loaded. You know, the spring was coiled and things were that cheap. And I would say today, things are about that cheap in the portfolio again. We've, even though we're up a bunch this year, mm -hmm. we've done some things under the hood to move some capital around and trim some things that are expensive. And we're putting capital to work in some very, very inexpensive assets today where we've kept the valuation of the overall portfolio low despite market valuations being wildly excessive, right? really as, as expensive of a market as we've had. And, and we can talk more in depth since, since you mentioned you want to get into it, but at market valuations that are broadly as expensive as they were at all the prior secular market peaks, 2000, late 1960s, 1929. We're, we're back to those levels and you've taken a lot of juice out of prospective returns if you're a broadly diversified S&P 500 type stock market owner. Yeah, and yeah, you, know, you sort of, uh, you know, in the middle of your previous answer, you just described uh, the parallels that you see between the markets today versus the markets in the late 1990s. You know, you see price to sales, and then you know, obviously, even adjusted for profit margins, you know, they're still pretty crazy. And and when you think, uh, and you know, one thing that you mentioned was, uh, you know, your investment in energy, which you're pretty heavy on, and you know. I've seen, you know, some, some, you know, great investors that I personally respect, Kevin Muir, Harris Kupperman, you know, they talked about how, you know, energy is simply not going to see any new supply, et cetera. So, um, and, you know, they're also super bullish on energy. So could you, so could you talk a little bit about, you know, your perspective on energy, you know, and the opportunities that you see in the, uh, see in the energy industry specifically? I think, yeah, I will. I, I, I think public policy broadly particularly in Europe and here as well in North America 
we are barreling down a path of shrinking and in some people's minds, eliminating carbon as a fuel source. And we're doing it under such a timeline and depending on the iteration of politician that's elected on an accelerating basis, way faster than we can shrink the carbon footprint. Yep. So if you believe the population of the globe will grow, mm -hmm. and I do, if you believe the population of North America will grow, and I do, then in terms of grid supply of power, in terms of power that supplies industry and home, we have one and a half, no more than 2% penetration of renewables between solar, wind, geothermal. We need to do more nuclear, um, but we are clearly shrinking the, the the carbon footprint, and certainly in coal. You've seen what Berkshire Hathaway has done. They've cut their coal production by half with their three main utilities. They signed the Paris Climate Accord that no other electric utility had signed. But you know, broadly speaking, electric utilities are shrinking coal, but you can't get away from coal entirely. Uh, you need coal in industrial purposes. When we sign Paris, we're allowing the emerging world, we're allowing China, we are shrinking coal fast. Europe is shrinking coal fast. China is allowed to increase its use of coal by a factor of one times the United States' use of coal over the next 15 years. China is massively increasing their use of coal and coal-fired plants. <laughs> Broadly speaking, we're not really shrinking coal. But if you want things like solar panels, which are effectively microprocessors, the only way to build microprocessor is by burning coal. You, you, you need that very high level of heat. Um, you talk about things like natural gas. Europe is on the precipice of a potential crisis this winter because they are not investing in gas. They are shrinking. I own a couple of refineries for the first time. I bought them in October. I was paying low single digit multiples to cash flow, big discounts to book value. Assets in the refining world, I mean, we've seen since 1981, the number of refineries cut in half, but we've seen, we've seen the productive capacity of refineries grow through investments and an expansion of current refineries. But we will no longer in the industrialized world. In Europe, you think Europe is ever going to build another refinery? We're not going to build another refinery in the United States. There are refineries for sale that nobody will bid on. Well, Holly Frontier, which I own now, and I paid roughly half of the current price. You know, it, it was being given away in October, as was Valero and a whole bunch of a whole bunch of energy assets. I mean, really high quality businesses with great balance sheets super assets were trading for low single digit multiples to cash flow. Bahala, so Shell, you know, we've all seen, you saw last week, you know, we all saw Shell sell nine and a half billion dollars or agree to sell nine and a half billion dollars of their assets, all of their assets in the Permian to ConocoPhillips. Earlier this year, they sold the Puget Sound refinery to Holly Frontier for what amounted to on paper, one and a half times EBITDA. And some friends of mine explained to me that trader that works for Shell is making a P&L, making commissions, and oftentimes is more interested in his own profitability and his own book than he is the refinery's book. Yeah. So in the hands of a more rational operator, like a Holly Frontier, they really bought it for about one times cash flow. Now, if you presume we're going to go to entirely electric vehicles, pick a number. Kathy Wood thinks we're going to be there in a nanosecond. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to be there in a nanosecond. There's structurally impediments to a whole bunch of people not being able to drive EV vehicles. They can't right. charge them, a whole, a whole host of reasons. But we'll have to increase grid supply of power. And if it's all going to be solar and wind, we're going to have to increase the supply of, 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 of power plant output by somewhere between 15 and 20% to increase the ability to charge all these vehicles. Where's it going to come from?
Again, our penetration of solar and wind is very low today. You saw the rolling blackouts of power in California last year and prior yeah, last years. Year, yep. You saw Texas. How many people died in Texas this year in the freeze? Yeah, the if you're California, if you're California and you're ahead of the curve because we're going to be carbon free and we're going to feel good about ourselves. California just closed Diablo Canyon, which is their last nuclear plant. That is insane public policy. California doesn't want to have gas-fired plants. They believe that leaning on solar and wind, you're not going to, and we're not going to build any more geothermal either, by the way. They're, the state of California hasn't allowed the construction of a, a dam, hydroelectric plant, in years and years and years, we need to let the water flow. They, they, they can't store it, you know, in the odd year when you get a bunch of rain, they wind up overflowing and having to release the fresh water into the Pacific. I mean, California is just a misguided place. But they believe when times are tight and the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining 24 hours a day, and it, it gets really hot in summer, early, early fall, that we can just buy grid off of the power off the non California grid. Well, guess what? The rest of the grids and the rest of the operators around the country are going to need their own power. If you have intermittent sources of power, wind and solar in particular, your grid has to stay constantly fired. You have to have natural gas. So if we're going to build a bunch of wind and we're going to build a bunch of solar, which Berkshire Hathaway is doing. Their, their utilities are spending an enormous sum of capital. They're far ahead of their electric utility competitors on building out renewables. They don't pay a dividend to the parent. They earn almost $4 billion. They retain it. They invest it in growth capex. So they're building wind, building solar. They're building out the grid that does not exist to bring all of this disparate, geographically disparate produced power into the urban core effectively rebuilding the entire electric grid, getting a high single digit, maybe 10% regulated return to do so. But you got to have natural gas. You need to have backup natural gas. Berkshire had a proposal in place to build simply backup natty gas fired plants in the event you had another freeze. Tesla had a competing offer that was a joke. You know, they, they were down for, I want to say four days, Berkshire's proposal would have supplied seven days worth of backup power. I think the Tesla proposal was going to provide with battery storage something like a few hours. It was laughable. They, they, you know, Greg Abel and Mr. Buffett laughed about it at the annual meeting this year. So we're, we're barreling down this path, I think, for a lot of good reasons. Even Even back under the Carter administration, when President Carter wanted to do more in renewables. He wanted to do more solar, wanted to do more wind, and public policy at that point pushed back against him. He was right, and we should have been building more all along. But today's policy prescription of getting there in a timetable that they think we can get there isn't going to happen. And again, we're not going to be adding. There's, ration there's rationality right now among the majors. You know, you've got Chevron and ExxonMobil controlling now big swath of the Permian, and they are not yet turning up the CapEx engine like they did prior to oil peaking over 100 bucks a barrel in 2015. I mean, you had 2012, 13, 14. The energy world was spending like drunken sailors, and they massively overbuilt capital stock. They overspent on exploration. They overspent on productive assets, a lot of which were not used then after oil rolled over from 15. But there's a scarcity coming, and you're starting to see it, and it's starting to enter into the mainstream, and, and we've been ahead of it. But you mark these assets to, to you know, what you would call normal profitability and then bake in some scarcity, and there's going to be some very real scarcity. I, I'm just it, – it's hard to not be very constructive on certain corners within the energy market. It doesn't mean you can throw money at anything, but, you know, with some very – carefully constructed assets. Uh, I, I think it's it's the most interesting environment for energy that I've ever seen of my 30 years investing capital. So it's, it, 
energy winds up with a big place in my portfolio. And then layer on top of that, you've got a whole bunch of people that can't do energy for ESG. Harvard just decided they're going to they're going to they're liquidate all of their energy assets. Um, the Rockefeller Foundation uh, had a lady call me a few years ago saying, "Hey, we're kind of interested in Semper. We're playing around. We'd love to talk to you about investing, but there'd be one condition: you would have to liquidate all of your energy holdings." <laughs> and I laughed. And I thought, "Are you not the same family of John D. and where all this <laughs> money came from?" I mean, you know, the the sovereign wealth fund in Norway. Likewise, and maybe this is a diversification thing, but they're also weaning themselves from energy assets. And oil and gas is 25% of Norway's GDP. Yeah. So you got all these institutional investors that are liquidating because they think we're going to feel good about liquidating these assets, but you can't have a, a functioning society without right. fossil fuels. It is not going to happen, and it's certainly not going to happen on those timelines. You take, and I don't want to go off on too many tangents and bore bore the audience but you know you take a barrel of unrefined crude and you run it through a refinery you wind up with propane and kerosene and jet fuel and gasoline and diesel all the way down to asphalt you think about all of the products that we use as a as a industrial society plastics all the things that come from chemicals come from refined crude you can't do what we do without refining crude. And depending on the grade of the crude, depending on the thickness of it, there's only so many products that you can run through it. If we're going to go to no gasoline, you're going to have to make some gasoline. Back under the John D. days, John D. Rockefeller, we used, we used crude oil, refined it into heating oil. Um, we didn't use gasoline. We didn't have the internal combustion engine yet. So they just dumped it into the rivers. Well, we're not going to be dumping it into the rivers today, but but I don't see any time soon we're going to have battery-powered airplanes, so you're going to have to have jet fuel. So they're, they're, there's, their public policy is well-intentioned, but it's creating scarcity that, again, I've never seen anything like this. And you've got to be still careful about the assets that you buy and the prices that you pay, but there's an enormous amount of upsize uh, uh, upside and there's a squeeze coming right and you know as yeah. you mentioned sort of the narrative you know you mentioned the various endowments of universities uh you know the sovereign wealth fund of norway and uh, and sort of the narrative is also i guess totally against energy and in a way that makes it like i guess the perfect time for value investors to sort of step in and get these uh you know get these companies at i guess more bargain prices and you now another I guess another you know area that's been hit very hard has been China, and I guess China is all is 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 in a way a completely different story because you know a lot of what's going on there depends on you know the uh, the internal politics as well as you know the public policy of the CCP, and you know we've seen um, everyone uh, on Twitter talk about this Evergrande and how that is China's Lehman moment, which I personally disagree with, but I would love to hear your thoughts on uh, China as uh, especially, you know, Chinese tech and, you know, if you see any opportunities there. I have expressly and purposefully never invested directly in China or in Hong Kong shares. Um, I won't go where you don't have rule of law. I find a system that's communist, that's controlled in China's case by the CCP. I have a very real disbelief that Western investors will reap the entire tale of profitability. When you're discounting the future cash flows of a business, you've got to believe at the end of the day that you're going to get them. And I don't believe inside a G run regime that capital is ever going to get out of the country. I think China followed Singapore, what Lee Kuan Yew had done and Charlie Munger talks about this. Um, China, China barreled down the path of capitalism, mm -hmm. communist controlled capitalism and in a 40 plus 50 year period of time. They grew their economy in real population adjusted terms very, very quickly. It, it, in terms of the growth, it looked a lot like Japan post World War II. Remarkable growth, even, even to the point where internally 
they were consuming so much of the world's resources that they probably over, have overbuilt their capital stock, not unlike what the Asian tigers had done. And you had the big collapse in 1997. But you look at you look at the current crackdown, and now China, now China policy is front and center. You look at what they've done with the education stocks. You look at Didi. They even said, "Look, don't go public." Didi went public, and then they slapped them hard. Um, Alibaba, which is down fifty percent, I don't believe the margin structure inside Alibaba. I think the Chinese culture is one of. Um, it's a homogenous culture where you've got a billion four people. And you fight for survival. And I think the, again, rule of law, the rule of accounting with integrity um, is lacking in some places. And I'm just not going to expose my capital directly in that environment. I, I never have and I never will. And I you know, let somebody else get rich faster if they've made a mountain of money in a short period of time on things like Tencent and Alibaba. And for a while with luck and I own Starbucks and that's about as much China exposure as I can tolerate. Uh, Starbucks is very expensive, and it's very expensive because they have a very long growth curve in front of them, largely in China, but globally, in terms of opening stores. They're still opening stores in North America, but in China, the growth curve to, to grow off of a very small base is very high. We've kind of teased out what the unit economics might look like inside of a Chinese store versus a North American store, and they're actually more profitable. And so... On the belief that you can't get capital out of the country, you could wake up one day and the Chinese could commandeer all of Starbucks China stores. That's not that's not off the table. You know that 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 exists in the back of my mind. And when I think about risks at Starbucks, it's not leveraging the balance sheet to buy back shares at what would now be an expensive price. It's not cannibalization of stores. It's not operational efficiencies in the line being understaffed or having too little capital equipment in the line and not being able to accommodate the line, mobile pay, drive through. They, they, you can figure all those things out. The single biggest risk in the case of a company like Starbucks is China. We own Richemont. And for China policy, I've watched Richemont grow from six or seven billion euros in revenues to what's going to be pushing 17, 18 billion dollars. A lot of that growth has been on Chinese demand. The Chinese customer likes jewelry. They like high-end watches. Well, Richemont owns Cartier and Van Cleef and Arpels. They just bought a, a Italian jewelry house. They've mm -hmm. got 10 or so very high-end watch brands. So it's a luxe brand. It looks a lot yep. like LVMH. Um, and opportunistically over the years, if you go back a few years when China – you remember, cut down on graft, and they made it illegal to bribe a party official. And those party officials that continue to take bribes tend to get disappeared. You know, is Jack Ma still around? I don't know. Um, but they, there was a lot of corruption in the Chinese system, and they rightfully cut down on graft. And so you couldn't send privately owned, uh, you couldn't send a paddock, or you couldn't send a Vacheron, Constantine, which is owned by Richemont, to a party official or to a you know, city official or to a company official and grease the wheels that had, as had been done. Well, at the same time they did that, and, and, and that cut down, as you can imagine, on $200,000 watch sales very quickly. Is either I'm going to bribe somebody with a watch or I'm going to go to prison or I'm going to get disappeared. Well, that, that tends to be impactful to the downside on revenues. At the same time, you had a giant property bubble in the Pacific Rim. Mm -hmm. Sydney, New Zealand, uh, Vancouver, Seattle, San Francisco. Chinese buyers were everywhere with suitcases full of cash trying to get their money out of the Chinese economy and into assets of any kind in the West. Yep. And capital controls being capital controls and Chinese communists being Chinese communists, they cut down on capital controls and well, all of a sudden... You couldn't fly to London and buy a watch because you couldn't leave the country. You couldn't. You could not move your capital out of the country. So, I, I think the I think the curve, if China continues to industrialize and they continue to move the middle class upward, you will have ongoing demand. And, and Richemont has internal distribution. They've got partnerships with Alibaba. They're on Tmall. 
uh, you know, they lean on Alipay, very technologically savvy. But again, that's that's a risk. If the Chinese customer is is banned in some way, shape, or form of buying Lux goods and traveling to buy Lux goods and with any sense of permanence, it, you'd have a problem. But the first time I was able to buy a Richemont, the stock had just gotten crushed because of the China concerns. And they were very real because you could see it in the top line and you can certainly see it in the margins. For a company that does 65% gross margins as, an, as a business, and that includes things like their, their soft goods. They own Peter Millar, for example, the golf shirt company. This thing might be a Peter Millar. Um, it's an impactful thing. And you know, on a two hundred thousand dollar watch, the gross margin there is going to be ninety five percent. When I first started studying the business, I thought, if you're going to have that kind of a gross margin, it's got to be markup on the cost of jewelry, and it's got to be the component cost of your diamonds and, and your, your gold, your gold and your rose gold, and, and and that's why you would charge that much. No, the, the the higher the price point, the higher the gross margin. It's just brand. It's markup. Uh, scarcity. You know, we talk about scarcity and energy. The best of the Lux goods manufacturers intentionally create scarcity. I'm going to walk into a store in Houston next week and do what I did last time I was there and go in with a specific eye toward buying a couple of Asherahs, which I'm actually not going to buy. But I want to see if there's anything in stock. Well, it's not in stock. The inventory is all moved. It's all in Asia. Some of it's in China. And some of that was a lack of ability to manufacture things last year. And they're finally catching up with demand, and they're finally back to work to making watches. We had a period of time when watchmakers were not making watches. And so as we've come out of the the V-shape last year's 2020s downturn, things are booming. And now you've got massive supply chain issues. Nike's seeing it. Costco's seeing it. Everybody's seeing it. Uh, but, you know, the China story there... Uh, you know, I've got plenty of I've got plenty of upside if the Chinese economy continues to grow, but I don't have to expressly directly invest in China where I think the risk of losing your capital is really high. So I would I would caution investors and, and now may be the absolute wrong time to do it because these stocks again, Alibaba's down more than half. Uh, you know, a bunch of these stocks have just been crushed. You know, today providing a little, you know, caution may not be the right time because you may have a great trading opportunity, but I've simply said never. We'll never own them. I'm not going to expose my capital to that kind of risk of permanent loss of capital. Yeah. And, you know, uh, and, you know as you said, you know, with the snap of, uh, snap of your fingers, you know, you could see your capital disappear forever in China. And, you know, that's just not the risk that, you know, you want to take. And well, you, know, move- you have, you have, I think in the mind of Xi, and the CCP, you may have public companies, and yeah. you may you may be able to, to you may be able to lean on the public markets, and you be able be able to lean on global markets for growth. But be clear in the mind of the party leaders; they own the assets. China owns the assets. The CCP owns the assets, whether they legally own them or not. They're going to own the assets. And so, you know, you better play the game. You better send your revenues. They'll send fines. However, they wind up doing it. The CCP is, is going to control the capital in that country. I, it's, it's just a fire that I'm not willing to play with. I've got plenty of other places to make money where I've got rule of law behind me. And it's a path I'm not going down. And it, it, it's not a new message either for us. We've never done it. I expressly stated, I had some great conversations with a great friend of mine, David Salem, who's Asked, would you ever invest in China? No. We've had long, long conversations about China and why or why not. And I always come down on the side of the why not. I just will not expose our capital to that kind of risk. Got it. Got it. Moving on, I wanted to get some of your thoughts on, I guess, in, in a way, it's a slightly psychological, but, you know, during periods of underperformance, you know, how do you keep yourself motivated and how do you keep, I guess, in a way, how do you keep yourself positive in the way you think during stretches of underperformance? Well, I'm the odd investor that when I see a bunch of green on the screen, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm counter. I'm not very happy. I've always got cash, cash flows, I've got a dividend yield that's north of the dividend yield of the S&P, even though only 20% of 
our company's profits come to us as dividends. I've still got dividends coming in that I have to reinvest. I've got clients with cash. I've got clients with cash on the sidelines that I don't yet have Mm -hmm. that I know will send in when things get cheap. I have portfolio sales, trims or outright sales of holdings in the portfolio. I've always got cash and cash flows to put to work. And I'd rather have low prices than high prices. Um, Clients, some clients love to log on and see every day themselves getting richer and richer. And, you know, if we were up 23% on our stocks mid-year, I lament that kind of thing because you're robbing from future performance. I would rather, I, I during that four-year stretch of 2012, 13, 14, 15, when I made 10, 10, 10, that was pretty even keel. But then being down 10%, and a lot of the names... Our gold mining stocks, for example, just got crushed and were very, very inexpensive at the end of 15. Some clients concerned about relative and absolute performance. If I didn't have any client considerations, I would have been ebullient doing cartwheels because of the opportunities to put money to work within our universe of companies that are viable, which given the, the deterioration in breadth during 15, Again, the average stock was down by a whole bunch, and there were opportunities galore. And so psychologically, I'm more wired, and I'm, I'm a lot more excited when things are cheap than I, are, than, 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 than I am in times like today when things have gone up. Now, under the hood, we've been very active in terms of trimming some things that are expensive and finding some things to buy that are very inexpensive. So I've managed to keep portfolio valuation cheap, but... I, I'm, I'm, I'm never simpatico. If clients are concerned about some level of performance, my, my mindset is usually the other way. And because part of our business is your bedside manner and, you know, you want your clients to understand at a deep level how you think and, and why you believe things. It, it, it's our job to, to, to let them know that low prices are actually a good thing, particularly if you have cash and cash to put to work. I'd say most of our clients have been with us for, for so long, we, we don't have any issues. Um, you know, we get very, very long leash from performance standpoint. It's newer clients and some that, that have not taken as much time as I would have liked to have learned kind of our processes and how we think. It's, it's the clients that read my entire too long <laughs> annual letter that I never have issues or problems with. So it's, it's psychologically, and I think it's a great con- contrarian mindset for investors to have. You want low prices. You, it's it's just a different way of thinking, but it's it's a contrarian spin that I think kind of makes you a dyed in the wool type value investor is the, the excitement that you get when everybody else is losing money. <laughs> yep, and that's when you know opportunity is uh, you know is plentiful and uh, yeah. Um, moving on, I also uh, wanted to discuss. So number one, no, in terms of. So, so I'm a freshman in college. So in terms of, you know, people in college and people just generally speaking who are young, what's your best advice for younger people? And more importantly, you know, if someone wants to get into the investment management or the asset management industry, you know, what sort of the career path you would recommend going through today? So, you know, it's the Wall Street in a way is not the Wild West that it was in the 80s and the 90s. So, you know, you can't just go get out of school and then get hired by, say, Goldman or work at, say, a prop desk. You know, you do, we don't have that anymore after, you know, the great financial crisis. So, uh, so, so, you know, let's do quickly some of the questions. So, number one, what's your best advice for young people in general? Number two, what's your best advice for or what's the career path you would recommend for, you know, those trying to get into investment management? Well, be a sponge for anybody. You're in a university setting. Take the time to actually learn. Lean on professors. Go see them in their after hours windows of time. You know, kind of get to know what they really believe beyond what they're teaching out of the textbook that day. If you've got some guy teaching efficient market hypothesis, hopefully there's something a little deeper to that professor than EMH and you know, it's your job as a student to tease that out. Get involved on campus. Go, you know, if you're at a big school or even small schools, you have lecture series. Expose yourself to all kinds of different thought. Get outside of your bubble. Get outside of, of, of the, the window that you think you're going to wind up in. If you're an accounting student, 
develop a, a, a more broad perspective. I think specifically from the investment side, you guys have so many more opportunities now to learn the investing game and cut your teeth during even your undergraduate years than existed anywhere when I was a kid and I was a student. Things like CFA has the research challenge. So each university can have two teams. You're in Canada. Uh, I've been judging our local contest in St. Louis for the 13 or 14 years that we've run it. I've been judging either the global finals or the America's finals uh, for the Institute, for the CFA Institute, mm -hmm. and have seen some exceptional teams from the Americas and globally. Waterloo has, the, the, very, the first time I, I judged the global final, Waterloo won. Uh, they presented okay. CT Tire, and they were absolute rock stars. I mean, they, they were as good as any 20-somethings I'd ever seen. But you see a lot of that, and that's an opportunity to get involved. But on a limited basis, you can only have, I mean, each university can have a couple teams, and if your university or your school doesn't do it, go find out why. You need to have a sponsor. Reach out to your local CFA society and say, hey, look, I'm at a school. We don't have a team. What would it take to get a team going? A lot of schools have student-run funds. They're managing a sleeve of their endowment. In fact, I, in my most recent client letter, I talked a little bit about student funds and showcased what Dayton was doing and have been thinking about best practices. Analyst that works with me had captained his team at SIU Carbondale when he was at school. He spent all four years of undergraduate working through the student-run fund. He was on the CFA Research Challenge pitch which is where I heard him present and was so impressed that I had him come to a transcript for a little roundtable conference that I host every year and then wound up interning with me and has worked with me for four years now, total, just an exceptional young man. But getting involved in your student funds, if your student fund exists, is really terrific. And again, you can have impact if you've, if you've familiarized with yourself with how they work. And in fact, I have a tab on my website, and if, if you read last year's letter, you go read this last year's letter, you can kind of see what I'm getting at, but we're in the process of gathering a bunch of data from as many different universities that have student-run funds managing a mm -hmm. portion of their endowment. We're trying to get as many sponsors of the funds or the, or the student CIO mm -hmm. or somebody from the fund to fill out our questionnaire because I'd like to go back and cover so a little bit of best practices on how to how to structure portfolios, how to involve more and more students, how to assign tasks, how to recruit to ensure continuity. A lot of times your student-run fund is a club. Sometimes it's taught in a class. They're all done a little bit differently. They have different benchmarks. They have different holding periods. Students have different assignments. Sometimes it's limited to only seniors in finance. You know, I think the best ones are open to the entire university. Why would you not? deny some student studying philosophy who's got an interest in investing the ability to get involved in the student-run fund. You can't make her or you can't make him the CIO right out of the gate. you got to cut your teeth. But those funds that allow students to cut their teeth for a longer and longer period of time, you know, at least two years, hopefully four, uh, better deal. My alma yeah. mater, University of Colorado, I tried to figure out if they even had a fund. It seemed as though they did not. The dean didn't think they had one. And I'm out there at Claremont McKenna where my daughter's going to school. She's at Scripps and doing all of her econ and business classes at Claremont. I had lunch with one of the professors. They were having me speak on campus at their value investing conference. I was having lunch with one of the profs and lamenting over my alma mater's lack of a student-run fund. And he said, well, they ought to have a fund because when I taught there, I was the sponsor. So I went back to Colorado and dug around a little under the hood, and there had been a guy who had made a grant. And between here and there, the management of the endowment shifted from internal to an OCIO, outsourced chief investment officer. And those guys are terrific. Um, but the student-run fund got a little bit lost. And occasionally, if you get a teacher that wants to include as part of that semester's class managing the student run fund, the OCIO will turn over that portion of the capital to that class and those students can pick some stocks in however long a semester is, four months. Well, that's that's not 
the continuity that you need when you're running a student fund. You need to you need to have the students running it all the time. Right. So I would not I would not at the moment put my alma mater, Boulder University of Colorado, at the top of the student run funds. But I've got a group of some very high placed alums, all big time, in various corners of the investment world, uh, interested in trying to help improve and interested in in speaking on campus and. You know, even getting a little more involved, and we need to bring the OCIO back in. But there are things like that. So, it, so it, it, if you're listening and you're an alumni of a university and you don't know whether your university has a fund, I would love it if you would reach out, try to figure out if you've got a student-run fund. Most schools have endowments. If you don't have a student-run fund, figure out why. And but then if you do try to find the sponsor or try to find some of the students involved. And I'd love to have them fill out our questionnaire because the more data that we wind up collecting here this year, uh, kind of the better that section is going to wind up being in the letter this year. You know, I may keep pushing on that Avenue, um, but there, there are, there are, there are a lot of things that you can do now in school, uh, both that are, that are taught directly in the classroom. I know at Colorado does a great job. They've got the Burridge center within the business school and they're taking kids to New York and San Francisco and they're doing private equity and they're doing venture cap type contests. None of that existed back then. So there's myriad, myriad ways for a student that's interested in the investing game to get involved in the investing game. And, you know, I think even during school, even though you're busy with all of your classwork and you're a freshman, so you're doing all of your weeder classes and you're not into the fun stuff that's more specific to what your major is going to wind up being. Mm-hmm. You've got to, you've got to get through all those classes, and you're going to have some long nights studying. But at the same time, there, there's there's time to read 10Ks and 10Qs and and governmental filings, especially if it's a hobby. Um, yep. You know, my analyst, in addition to doing the research challenge and doing the student run fund, um, he had a full ride academically. He was his mother had gone to school. I think he was the only the second in his family to go to school. He also ran a landscape architecture business. Um, all four years of school. So he had a payroll, wow. he had capital equipment, knew how to run his books and knew how to budget. And um, again, just the whole package made him that impressive to me uh, when I brought him in as an intern and then ultimately as a, the, the, our, our first paid analyst. Um, get involved. And by the end of your, you know, senior year, you'll have done much more than anybody would have been exposed to 20, 30, 40 years ago. You can late in the game, start sitting for the CFA exams. You can take CFA one as an undergraduate now. Well, that nobody even heard of that. I mean, there were very few, there was very little awareness of what the CFA was. And now it's a thing and you can see it in the candidate numbers. You can see it in the number of people taking the exams each year. Right. And it's drilled down to where very young people are aware of what the, the candidate program is all about. Aaron, my analyst, finished CFA two about a month or two, whenever it was, June, uh, after he graduated. Well, I'd never even, I didn't even hear the CFA until after I graduated. It just, it, again, it was not a thing. And so avail yourself of all of the opportunity that you'll have in the next four years. And by the time you're 21, 22 years old and graduating, you'll be, you'll be, you're already ahead of the game, but you know, you'll be way ahead of the game. But again, anybody interested, there are plenty of things to do. You know, there, there are guys, I was talking to a guy the other day uh, who had gone to University of Florida and Mr. Buffett, before he started having students come to Omaha, whenever he was out, you know, seeing companies or seeing friends, you know, he would, he would pop up on campus every now and then. And he spoke at Florida and a friend of mine said, yeah, I was at Florida. I was too stupid and I was drinking too much to realize that I should have availed myself of going to listen to Mr. Buffett speak, whatever it was, 30 years ago or 25 right. years ago. So Warren Buffett's not coming to your campus now, but you'll have a lot of people on campus. And like I say, you've got various lecture series. And so avail yourself of all the opportunity. A lot, a lot of different schools of thought. Yep, absolutely. 100%. And, you know, it's, and, you know, it's been terrific having you on the podcast. I think that was a great way to end it, you know, sort of career advice and what, you know, young people should be doing. And uh, considering the fact that, a good portion of the demographic that listens to my podcast is pretty young. You know, I think I, I think you know that's a great place to 
leave it off. You know, Chris, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's been an absolute pr uh, pleasure chatting with you. And, you know, we should do this again. Well, I'd love sure. to. And it's been fun listening to your podcast. You've had some great guests on. You, you do a nice job. I'm, again, fascinated to see the evolution of your young investing career and where you wind up being a few years out. But keep it up. You're doing great. Thank you.